What's up, everybody? It's Joe LaPuma. You are listening. You are watching the Complex Sneakers Podcast. As always, I'm kind of with my guys, Mr. Matt Welty. Yeah, we're here, but in different places, right? <laughs> different places, but the show goes on. And of course, Mr. Brendan Dunn. How we doing, guys? We're here, but we're there. We're everywhere, all together, and nowhere at once. Joe, where are you right now? I am in LA. I am in a room that is a... There's a lot of makeshift stuff going on. <laughs> what are you doing in LA? Can you tell us? We're shooting a lot of episodes for the new season of Sneaker Shopping. That one good thing, besides the one, one drawback of not being with you guys in studio, mm -hmm. the, one of the pro of it is, yeah, the, the pro of it is we did get a bunch of episodes for the new season of Sneaker Shopping in the can. So give us some hints. out here. I can't give any hints, but oh, we do have... come on. Not for the I podcast can't, listeners, can't, you can't give one hint? I can't. I can't okay. really. I can't. I tried, you know, I'm a little secretive. I'm sorry. I'm a little secretive, but I think people are really going to like it. I have to my left, right here, <laughs> Dave Matthews. Dave Matthews, okay, he, mm -hmm. he producer. we flew to L.A. Yes, yeah, super producer Dave Matthews. We flew to L.A. 8.06 a.m. 8.06 a.m. I'm, I'm on the plane already, mm -hmm. and he texts me, um... What do you guys want from Shake Shack? Me and Jose, the director. 806. Then then he goes Shake Shack is closed. He that's, goes Shake Shack is closed. Terrible news. So I'm going to I'm going to get a burrito instead and he ate in perfect Dave Matthews fashion. He ate a burrito at the gate and then got on the 6-hour flight to LA. At least so, he ate it before he got on the plane. At 8 o'clock in the morning. I know. 8 o'clock. I checked the timestamp before 806 a.m. He had a burrito. And usually his move is to eat it on the plane. Right, right, but, right. We've heard about know, that before. With, Did he have the yeah. Mountain Dew fired up as, <laughs> as well? To that point, last night on set, literally someone of the crew was like, man, Dave, you know, I remember I remember one day you showed up to with that Code Red at, <laughs> at 8.30. Seriously. I'm a Code Red fan. Like, I support that. Yeah, I well, support that. Someone said that. Someone was like, you know, Dave, I, I really like that you like Mountain Dew. I remember you showed up that morning with Code Red, and in the morning Dave, though, if you have Code Red yeah. before noon, that's a little, that's a little questionable. Yep, and there he goes. He's running to get the extension cord, so we don't. <laughs> we, we appreciate we don't, the it. The laptop doesn't die. Yeah, we. Uh, we appreciate. What, what about uh, sugar-free Dr. We make Pepper it before noon? Yeah, sugar-free Dr. Pepper. That's right. Okay. <laughs> We're all about that. Listen, a couple weeks ago, Dunn was very gracious in highlighting some personal celebrations. We got to talk. About our guy's birthday. It was our guy's birthday. Oh Matt, my Matt goodness! Welty. Yes. How come? Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna definitely announce. My, no. Actually, let's not talk about my birthday. I was trying to figure out how we would handle it because. But let's talk about Welty's birthday, which it's, was this past weekend. Yes. It's we. It's. I feel like it's weird. And, and Joe didn't mention his birthday when we were coming up on it, and now we just it, it, miss Welty's birthday. Well, it's it's weird because it's one of those situations where I feel like, you know, you 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 kind of you don't want to announce it, but yeah. the only way like the general public would kind of know is if you sure. put it out there sure except for those people who follow you on facebook you know like those <laughs> are the know. only people who get the alerts they know yeah you always get like the random person you haven't spoken to in nine years who hits you up at like six o'clock in the morning with a happy birthday so, so how did you celebrate what, what, what were the festivities uh so turned 35 which felt like kind of a monumental okay. mm -hmm. turn in my life i can uh, run for president the candidate we can all agree on um <laughs> <laughs> free free sneakers for all right okay um, okay yeah, went to New York Rebel, played in the afternoon. So I went to a Portuguese clubhouse in yep. lovely Newark, New Jersey. Had a few beers. And had incredibly some, fitting. I can think of no some, better way for Matt Welty to celebrate Had some grilled meat. Uh, I know I posted the photos. For the first time in my life, I got iced, iced. by someone. Yes. Yep, yep. That's never happened to me before. Joe, has that ever happened to you? No, but I thought that is that still going on? No, I didn't think. Like, it, I didn't think that it was almost a, a decade ago. I didn't think it was a thing either. And then someone walked up to me. And, and what is it exactly? It's when someone presents you with a Smirnoff ice. Gotcha. When, if you don't see it coming, and the, and they present it to you, you you're forced to drink the whole thing at gotcha. once. So that happened. I didn't think people still did that. It happened to me. Um, yeah. Any presents? I got something very special. Oh. Oh, the, I, did you bring it? I think I didn't. I, br I didn't bring it. I, I didn't. Joe, wait. Did, did you get him anything? Because I didn't get him anything. No, I didn't. I didn't get him anything. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean, nobody got you anything. I guess nobody's getting me anything. Welty, what was the present you got? Uh, <laughs> I got a customizer in the UK. Blunt Shank sent me mm -hmm. a pair of one-on-one, one-of-one 
custom Adidas Stan Smith with my face and on Amazing. the tongue and Amazing. on the heel. But I wasn't. I got the package in the mail today, right before I came to the set, and I wasn't expecting it. And I opened it up, and he actually wrapped it in paper and wrote "Happy Birthday" on the thing with like a little bow. Beautiful. And I was. It was the. You know what? It was. It was awesome, and I really appreciate it. It was probably the best thing that happened. And let me tell you, the design of your face on the tongue looks <laughs> so professional. Yeah. It looks so professional. It, like, look, it th looked like he, a shoe Adidas made. Yeah, I was, yes, I was really surprised. It really does. I'll bring him in for next podcast. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think I have a pair from him, too, not to steal your thunder here, but yeah. I think when I went to Liverpool oh, for Laces Out, I think that he made he was the custom, made, so yeah. Joe, you're a little behind on that. Okay. Joe, has anyone ever made you? Has anyone ever made you custom sneakers besides the Air JLP from Shoe, Shoe Surgeon. Surgeon? There's been a few, but but I don't think like painting. I think more kind of like permanent marker type of stuff. I, yeah. I and forgive me if I'm forgetting any, but they'll let you know like, if you are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not yeah, not like that. Stan Smith. That looks like, to be honest. Not that they should do a program like that, but like if you could put your face on the Stan Smith tongue, it's not bad. It's not yeah, bad. Not bad. Very cool. Very cool. How's the week going in New York, guys? It was good. You know, I had a we we had a little bit of a three day weekend here. I went hiking. I went up to Harriman State Park. You know, we might have to. I was thinking we might have to do like a, a camping trip, the three of us, to really you know kind of like a team bonding moment. Would you, Would you guys go camping? I was actually considering going there like a few months back. It's like kind of a hassle you kind of have to take like a crazy mm. train to... i feel like I, I don't know if i can see joe lapuma camping i did camp a few years ago no internet no okay. internet only at the did you camp ever store. growing up in long island is that a thing at all no uh, i'm sure it's a thing i i never camped but i did camp a few years ago and the first night torrential downpour in the tent <laughs> you're, torrential, you're torrential into the downpour. wild outdoors yeah the, yeah I, I really got thrown, I, thrown into i would it. think i would think that joe I don't, I don't know if you're like a rough and tumble outdoors guy, <laughs> but I am just for the record, you could fit the aesthetic lately because you have been wearing all of the ACG sneakers. So yeah, you, you got to put them to work. So, so you will be that's outfitted true. for the great outdoors. Yeah, yeah. That's true. Good point. Good Joe, point. Odd, odd you're starting, starting a campfire or not? I'm not good at that stuff. I'm not good <laughs> at that stuff. I, you know, I could, I could like clean up the campsite. I could uh -huh. organize safety, things. Safety inspector. Yeah, I, I, starting the fire, I'm not sure if I would bode well doing could, that. Could you could you put up the tent at least? I could help. I could help. <laughs> I'm not the by tent myself? guy. But I tell you what, I split a lot of firewood growing up. We we didn't. The, the main source of heat in my house was a, was a wood yeah, stove. Oh yeah, you so lived in. Yeah. We, we we stacked a lot of wood in those uh, winter months. You're stacking chips, wood chips. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm still not the best at building fire. But we, we'll set up the camping trip very very soon. I'm down. Bring, bring all our. I'm down. Let's out. do it. <laughs> Any sneaker news that we need to get to? There's a few sneaker things I want to talk about. I don't know how y'all feel about them, but these Stingwater Dunks, are you guys as big on these as I am? I, I feel like it's a really wonky looking shoe and it shouldn't work, but it, it's it's actually quite cool. And this guy sold a cardboard box for $100 yeah. Yeah. with just his, his sticker on it and it's sold out. Like, I, I love that shoe. It's a shoe to me that I'm not really into, but I could see when people start wearing it or I see it on foot, I may take a liking to it more, but um, right now I don't think that I'm that uh, interested in those, but I, I could see those growing on me. Is that a pun, like because of the mushroom thing, like they're gonna grow on you? It's not, but you're, you have, your quick wit is always there. I feel like I feel like Welty is into this shoe. You like this uh, shoe, right? Yeah, actually, uh, I mean, it should come out by the time, hopefully, fingers crossed, by yeah. the time we do this, we just got a text message from the Stingwater guys wanting yeah. to work on some content with it the shoe inspired by the amanita muscaria mushroom this is a mushroom you're familiar with uh which is not a psilocybin mushroom okay although they are hmm. both psychedelic okay uh this the amanita muscaria ones are the red ones with the white dots the super mario looking super right. mario yeah. also there's a story that that's what the whole santa claus christmas you were telling story, me this. story is about there's like wow. this weird there's this weird tale that like back in like the 1500s, like people used to sneak through the chimney and drop off mushrooms into people's homes and like reindeers and like Norway used to like eat them and go crazy. So there's like a little crazy tale behind that shoe that may or may not find out about. Shoe, shoe that seems a like a cool story for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When think, do they drop? Um, I think May 10. May 8th. May 8th. I and think, then I, I, maybe, like that, maybe yeah. May 10 on sneakers. I don't yeah. know. I always feel guilty when I don't have the dates right off the top of my head, but. I'm sure you'll get a pair, Joe. Okay. 
Uh, one, you know what, Don? I feel a little bit. I I will give one sort of hint to the new season. Oh, I love it's this. Very, it. It's very small, but I will say we shot with someone who said the new Travis Six is better than the old Travis Six. We were talking about I think that. So. I think the suede just looks better on it. Um, I haven't held the new one in my hands yet. I have the first one, no flex, just saying. And I, mm -hmm. I, I haven't seen the new one in person. So I, I, uh, based off the PNGs and the JPEGs, <laughs> I'm, I like the first one better, but that's just me. Here's another point that the guest made. He said, don't judge these shoes off pictures. They look so much better in person. So it's funny you said that. Okay, well, um, I like them. And it's not, guys, it's not Travis Scott. <laughs> okay, we just got to get that okay, out there right away. Yeah, let's Set just the expectations it's not Travis properly. Scott. All right, <laughs> fair enough. I, I want, there's yeah. another shoe coming out this week that I'm not a fan of, the, the Supreme 96. That may be the worst Supreme Nike collaboration ever. The Those shoes are awful. Ugh. I can picture Joe wearing them. No, no shots. Just, <laughs> he, said, he said, hold on. The okay. second was, those are awful. And then no, I, I can, can picture just, Joe wearing I can picture, them. I can picture Joe LaPuma shoe a little bit. <laughs> Why do you say that? It's a Premier Max. Do you in, like the shoe, Joe? They come in black. The, the, it's the clear one, right? Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I, I, I have two pairs of clear sneakers in the last month or so that I really like, I think I'm going to hold off on, on another see-through sneaker. But it was funny because I did hit PG Nose for the, it, like, I saw an invisible woman. The thing about PG Nose, I know we always <laughs> talk about him, but he just Roll sometimes, I know, I know, hold on, no, 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 hold on. You know, he just posts on his IG story and sometimes you're just like scrolling through and the invisible woman, Air Force One, the clear one, which I think has aged not great. The mm -hmm. fair? The, the, the blue or the purple? Blue, blue. Same thing to me. Yeah, the blue one. Colorblind. And I was like, I think I hit him like, man, should I? And he was like, I think he almost was like, no, you shouldn't. <laughs> I love that. I the, love the, that on, the, For the first time that Paul <laughs> yes. is like one of the most shystiest people I know, and I, and I say that affectionately. Of course, of course. A close friend Lovingly. of yours. Yes, but, you, but him actually telling you, no, you shouldn't buy it is a he, rare moment of truth from that man. He basically said that, but you know what that is? That is old school complex hype. They were definitely always in the office. Sure. I think we definitely featured them in the magazine, and that's where I kind of recognize them from, you know? I could see that. No, I mean, there's certain shoes like that I wouldn't, maybe they're nostalgic, but you just kind of, they're associated with that era, you mm -hmm. know, where they may not even have aged as the best shoes, like the patent leather Avenger Dunks, which like people don't go that crazy for nowadays, but I just remember seeing the purple ones on Nike Talk back in the day, and like it's so like significant to that era of... Wait, that's B Dunk? Yeah. Is this the same one that, that Joe got, and you said that they were not that yes. good? I think, <laughs> no, no I think, I think I, Joe, Joe, one. Joe got the blue one that wasn't patent. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay, I but thought I we did were... have... <laughs> I, I did get the purple patent leather right. from Special Sauce when they released. Those are released. good. Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. I thought, I thought you were once again shitting on Joe's No, like, no. Come on. Man. Yeah, my footwear <laughs> choices. This guy, tough. I'm not, I'm not, hey, I'm not birthday. hating at all, You're lucky man. it's your birthday week, okay? <laughs> I'm not hating at, I'm not hating at all. <laughs> Wealthy, I'm not hating at all. <laughs> not at all. It's funny that we bring up the Invisible Woman and it's kind of like caught up in the hype and there's certain... There's different avenues of hype. A lot I always talk about how I remember that from the early days of Complex. But our fan question from eBay, the giveaway this week, comes from James. And he says, has the hype on the internet ever influenced your decision about a sneaker? And this is James from Chicago, Illinois. You know, you, know, you guys know that I'm going to admit, of course, things always grow on me. But I think that I would definitely, in terms of a specific shoe, I couldn't even mention one specifically because i think it happens a lot just being yeah. transparent yeah U union fours for you or union for joe fours or I for like everybody for everyone. Union fours <laughs> I, oh union fours is a good example but union fours i like from the jump wealthy what about you i was interested in your in your kind of answer to this a shoe that's like really grown on me like because of the hype or on has the it has it ever happened the hype the hype on the internet if, I, I i'm glad you admitted joe because it is important to like a lot of people say oh the hype doesn't influence me everybody is is influenced by the hype whether or not they can confront that uh, i definitely have had moments recently where i just said fuck it and bought the shoes yeah you know do you when, remember what they were well even recently i was not planning on buying those structured triacs yeah and then i got the link to it and i just purchased it i yeah. think we had all gotten the link and then i didn't even get the shoes 
Oh, right, because they canceled your order or something Because the like shoes that. got stuck in, like, a New Jersey, like, uh, uh, whatever you call it, center. Yeah, Distri- yeah. Distribution center. Got yeah. Like, yeah, so I never got the shoes. Yeah. But that was a recent one? Yeah. yeah. What about you? Yeah, I, I, I struggle to think of a specific shoe, and that's not me, like, offering a cop-out. That's just me saying that it happens all the time, and I think it's really good to be, you know, we're not immune to, to hype. Oh, I have actually have a really good one for me or for you. No, for I, I when I just remembered. Okay, please. So I think the year was two thousand and seven. Okay, and I had just started working or working at Foot Locker, recent ish, and I didn't own any Air Max ninety fives yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, people know I love Air Max ninety fives now and then, but the first pair that I got, there was like, remember on Nike Talk, there'd always be a really shitty, uh, like kind of like. Uh, product um line sheet photo yeah, that yeah, would leak yeah. first and it wouldn't really even show what the sneaker looked like it sure. was like the colors weren't very flat image correct all yeah. that sort of stuff so this air max 95 leaks and it looked like it was a white black and hot lava air max 95 and i'm like these are going to be amazing these are gonna be future classics they're like infrared 90s but air max 95s uh-huh. they're gonna drop at foot action i need the shoes like i'm gonna get a discount because i'm working at foot locker mm-hmm. so i go there and they finally come out and it wasn't white on the upper it was like people use i think on nike talk actually said it looks like cat poop it was like this like oh. actually it was it was it was the same color as your your sweatshirt right now instead of white <laughs> This Casual. guy is this guy Perfect. is pa- this Perfect. guy's passive aggressiveness today is, is, is really new, oh, wow. new levels, new heights. Oh, anyways, yes. no, it just happened. It was a uh, what? Anyways, and it was the shittiest pleather I've ever seen <laughs> on the shoes. They were awful, but yeah. me and my friend both agreed to buy them, and I knew the shoes were bad, and I yeah. bought two pairs of them. Motivated on the purely by the hype. Actually, now that I'm thinking a little bit. Thinking back, and this is not necessarily one I regret, but just that a shoe was kind of built on hype and wasn't as good as its predecessor is the Nike Kobe 10 HTM. Because the yeah. HTM Kobe 9s were so good, but the HTM Kobe 10s were kind of boring. But I remember just buying it immediately because it was this limited thing, and I, I, I knew it was going to be hard to get. And I just said, let me let me buy into that. And not a shoe that I liked on a personal level at all. I think I still have them sitting around somewhere. Again, not one I regret, but still, still definitely one that that the hype led me there. So like Joe said, this is our eBay question of the week, which means we're giving away some free sneakers to James Bett who submitted that question. A lot of people have been asking us how to submit the questions. So every week on the podcast, we're giving away a free pair of sneakers through eBay and their authenticity guarantee program. We tweet out the call for submissions for your questions on Friday afternoon, usually around 3 p.m. Eastern. You can submit a question to ask us on the air and if we pick your question you will win the sneakers so we do have a pair of sneakers this week for james and these ones are from joe joe this is this is such a joe lapuma sneaker james you're getting these for free you see the ebay authenticity guarantee tag on there laser jordan fours joe how much does this sneaker mean to you rare air i love this shoe i wear them on sneaker shopping all the time we just talked about the invisible woman being so present and complex i think i've said it on this podcast many times Uh, I was a young intern at Complex Bradley Carbone, Mm -hmm. the first footwear associate editor, used to wear them all the time. And I recently got them a few years ago. And then I actually got a second pair because Matt Welty didn't sell me his for a good price. Someone, uh, I mentioned the the, uh, person who, who sold me the pair for a really good price. But not as good as getting them free. So James, enjoy those. Yes. A great, great Jordan 4. Absolutely. And I uh, hope shoes. you enjoy them as much as I do. And James, just so you know, if these are not your size, we make no apologies, but do know you can sell them on eBay with no seller fees for every shoe over $100. So there you go. There was there was people who were asking if that was my pair. Yes, I saw that. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, wait. That. People thought that we were giving away the same Jordan 4s yes. that you wore yes. on Full Size Run yes. through the eBay Authenticity yeah. Guarantee Program. <laughs> no, different pair. Different yeah, pair. Those are, those are long gone. <laughs> right um 
All right, guys. Well, let's get to this week's guest. We have a great guest. Our guest on today's podcast is a graffiti legend whose art has been highly sought after for almost 50 years. In the 70s, you'd find his art on the subway cars and walls of New York City. After tagging the streets of New York City, he would go on to link up with friends Keith Haring and Basquiat in the 80s and began exhibiting his work alongside them in galleries. After making a name for himself in multiple art scenes, he studied graphic design and parlayed his degree into making the logos for iconic hip-hop artists and collectives like the Beastie Boys, LL Cool J, Public Enemy, and Tommy Boy Records. Some of your favorite album covers? Yeah, he did them. Proving his art could become extremely sought after in any form, he would then add a clothing line bearing his name to his already extensive resume. Throughout the years, he lent his design to everything from basketball jerseys, Stussy t-shirts, G-Shock watches, and more. And when it comes to sneakers, he's collaborated with New Balance, Adidas, and Nike on an Air Force One and two dunks that were released in 2003 and are more sought after today than ever before. This man is the definition of lifelong relevancy in everything street and style culture. Please welcome to the Complex Sneakers podcast, Eric Hayes. How you doing, Hayes? Thanks so much. Doing great. Thank you, fellas. Appreciate the lovely introduction. Man, Thanks, you, man. You, you've been around for so long. Hayes, we, we want to go back. I want to know about kind of your childhood, 70s, 80s, New York City. What did sneakers look like back then for you? Wow. Uh, sneakers sort of looked like the bargain bin at Models back then. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But, but really, uh, you know, the, the, the Clydes were it back then. The first suede Puma Clydes were it. Um, you know, but we're talking, we, we can go all the way back to PF Flyers and the, the whistle ring. If you, uh, huh. <laughs> when did they first become like important for you as a kid? Um, you know, in a way they were always important. Like sneakers were, were a thing in New York. Uh, right. I can actually remember, um, playing football on the block. We were probably six or seven years old when uh, some kids stopped and tried to take my man off for his pro kids. So um, you know, that, that, that tells you something about supply and demand all the way back then. But How did it um, go? Um, my man bent down to act like he was going to take him off to get played, and then he did a dead run sprint out of that position. And... <laughs> And dudes broke out in a hurry. <laughs> so the pro kids had the right running technology. At least we know that. Yeah. When, when did you guys graduate beyond that stuff into Nike and Adidas? Kind of is that, is that late seventies for you? Um, uh, late seventies is kind of Orchard Street era. Um, okay. You know, as we as as uh, as priest. Chris Lee's and BVDs and that whole look, uh, you know, uh, your Casals with no lenses and all that good stuff. Uh, Orchard Street was the spot, at least for us Manhattan kids. Mm-hmm. Um, no, you know, Brooklyn kids were probably at Fulton Mall doing the same thing. But um, that's where, uh, you know, everybody started uh, choosing different flavors every day and flexing, flexing different ways. How big were sneakers in the graffiti scene early on in the whole like style wars era um they they were as they were really big um and i would say they were big in the way that fat laces were big um you know i think Fat laces went hand in hand with that era, which went hand in hand with hip hop, which went hand in hand with graffiti. And, uh, you know, if you think of if you think of fat laces, uh, untied, tucked inside the sneakers, that's that's the era. That's the jam. Were, were there sneakers that you just completely torched with paint in that era that you, you were like, oh, I, you'd get mad if you got drops on it? Um, yes and no, because here's here's the rub to that when we were. When we were little kids and we were toys, like we kind of wanted to have ink on our sneakers, like you know, if you saw some to show that, to show people that you, you, you were, were in the game. That you were that you were down with the game. Um, but uh, real talk, once you were up on the game, um, you tried to keep keep everything crisp because you don't want to give the game away. And then there were there were guys like Keith Haring and Basquiat who you were kind of around in that era. I, I, there's some iconic photos of Keith Haring and Jordan Ones. Were, were, were your your contemporaries in the art scene, super into sneakers, was it important for them? Yes. Um, you know, Keith was a close, close friend from 
the days he was a busboy before he was, um, you know, what we know him to be now. And yeah, Keith always, uh, Keith always rocked different sneakers and, and whatever was fly. I mean, what I remember Keith always rocking was the Adidas top tens, right? Which, right. Okay. which, you know, which, which, uh, if, if you know me, you know, I'm a white on white guy. And that was mm-hmm. my jam back then was the white on white on white top tens. I, I, I know that you even later on, you were a white on white Nike Air Force One guy, right? Somebody told me that there was a point at 21 Mercer Street, which the kids now call Nike Lab, where you would go in and they always, I don't know if it's size 12 or size 13, but some Air Force Ones waiting for you. No doubt. Um, <laughs> you know, if you, if you wear size 13 uh, and you know how limited they are, you, you grab whatever you can get. I, I, I typically buy my white on white Air Force dailies uh, three, four at a time, just so, you know. It's a rotation, right? And Hayes, you also, what I love is you wear white on whites on the red carpet a lot. I see a lot of red carpet photos and, you know, you'll be dripped down in a suit but sometimes, but it's white on white. It caps off the outfit. 100, man. Got to keep it classic. And, uh, you know, like I forget who said it in the beginning, but we're just not trying to reinvent the wheel here. Mm-hmm. Okay. You, you end up going to Japan very early on, you open up a store out there. How much did uh, Japan and Tokyo's sneaker scene influence you in that era in the 90s? Um, you know, I think it sort of influenced us intellectually uh, mm-hmm. more than per se in terms of style. I mean, we were already down with sneaker culture um, and it was sort of symbiotic with the development of that era where, um, you know, we were, we was a handful of us were sort of the first artists given the, the blessed opportunity to collaborate with the Nikes and, and um, the major players. And that sort of set a tone. And, you know, Japan sort of tends to magnify everything um, as well as adopt it um, in their own image to some degree. So um, whatever... Whatever heat was coming out of America, it sort of uh, it, it refracted in Asia, and, and I think it's what I often refer to as sort of a mirror effect. Um, you know, something will catch hold in Asia, and then it'll bounce off America and come back to Japan harder, or mm-hmm. vice versa. So um, I think uh, the kind of uh, sort of uh, if. If we were just living it when we got to Japan, we started to understand sort of the market, the cultural marketing aspect of it in a, in a way that maybe we didn't just uh, sort of inside the bubble of our New York lives. So uh, I think same, same as my going to Los Angeles, um, these, these uh, tours and, and sense of inclusion in other other geography and cultures gave us a different perspective on what we were originally doing at home. And you talk about those converging cultures. Do you remember in Japan, like meeting guys like Nigo? Do you remember that first meeting and what that was like? Any details you could share? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I uh, was fortunate enough to meet Hiroshi and Nigo uh, very early in in the whole cycle of things. Um, I don't think Bathing Ape had been born yet. Um, I certainly have, uh, you know, in my press book, I've got my share of uh, shots of both of them wearing Hayes gear back in the beginning. Um, awesome. But uh, that you know, we, we've we've all sort of found our own lanes. Um, you know, some of these uh, some of these relationships remain just friendships. Some of them grew into you know crossing over into business or branding. Uh, I've actually even done. I did the logo for Bathing Ape for Bape Records for Nigo and things mm. like that. So it's it's wow. it's uh, the relationships are uh, maybe not as one dimensional as it as it may. Um, seem at times i think Mm -hmm. and and to that point everything's gone in cycles i think it's been interesting to see where 
Um, obviously, sort of uh, America launched the notion of streetwear, and then it uh, was sort of uh, the baton was picked up and ran with full speed in Asia and Europe. And uh, sort of for the first 15, 20 years, you'd, it felt like different places would blip up on the radar, and like Los Angeles was hot, and then Hong Kong was hot, or Tokyo or Osaka. And to me, the beauty of it in the last especially five, ten years, is that everybody has established their own homegrown thing. So right. that sort of leveled the playing field in a way it, 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 um, where, where you can't sort of trade on just being uniquely new as much anymore. Um, it's sort of uh, up the ante in terms of quality, uh, quality of uh, materials, quality of thought, quality of marketing. So um, in a way, in a sort of friendly competitive landscape, uh, we all sort of uh, push each other to, to in a funny way and in, in the same way as we were on the trains you know we were we were we were down with each other but we were competing and at the end of the day um you know you were trying to burn each other but uh it was a uh, school of art school of thought where we uh the comp the competition was healthy and pushed us to uh excel and i think that's true for the modern world of sneakers, branding, collaborations, and everything is that um, when we get in these uh, either new or old collaboration relationships, we're constantly trying to push our partner or client to sort of break the mold. And, and where's where's the edge we can push? Where's the right. new technology nobody's seen? Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's postmodernism... Uh, it's recontextualizing. I want to ask, you mentioned Hiroshi and Nigo. Were you having sneaker conversations with them back then? Were you connected with them through sneakers? A lot of influence sort of happened by osmosis that way, I'd say. 2003, you end up getting the Nike collaboration on the two dunks, which have become legendary part of sneaker history. At this point, you know, they resell for over $1,000 a piece. On StockX, there's the high top and the low top one, the high top being a lighter colorway, low top being a darker colorway. I'd read that Nike kind of had this overspray technique that they said that they could do at the time, and they approached you with it and said, hey, what do you think? And you're like, I can do this shoe. Like, how did those sneakers come about? What was it like designing them? What was the process? Um, that's correct, actually. Uh uh, Jesse Leva and some of the team at Nike at the time um, came to me with the overspray technique that's on those dunks and said, basically, we've developed this new overspray technique and uh, we think you're the right guy to launch it with. And, you know, from there on, um, uh, it was it was. Uh, it was on me to decide colorways and approaches and and also to me one of the the shining moments of that collaboration was being able to do the box yeah um you know i think uh very few boxes had been done um for for, for commercial release let's say um so you know my I, I had a nice runway with which to see how to best launch that um obviously it was a blessing to be in that seat at that time it was a very pivotal um sort of moment in uh, collaborations but so i chose the black white and gray which you know uh, sort of is how i represent as a brand and we flipped it from you know reversed it from the highs and lows and uh you know uh tried to add yet a different kind of fingerprint with the overspray and the stencil effect on the box. That was my sort of uh, trying to uh, uh, take the spray concept, but not in the most obvious uh, right. copper, copper spray tag on it um, fashion. And uh, that was, uh, you know, looking back, it, it obviously it's a, it's a bigger moment now 
then yeah, like, I think. Did it, uh, did it feel big then for you? Because it was, it was this moment where Nike, you know, a lot of these people that they're tapping at the time are people who you grew up around, whether it's Futur or Stash, and there's this crop of graffiti writers who are kind of ushering Nike's products into this new era with collaborations. Did it feel like the dawn of a new era for you back then? It did. It felt huge. Um, it was, it, I would say it sort of sealed the deal on the dawn of a new era because we had started doing collaborations with uh, G-Shock, for example, mm -hmm. in 99. Um, so, and sort of to take a little uh, tangent for a moment, look, there was a point... Uh, there was a point where I was full time running a graphic design studio, and I hadn't. I had been doing some T-shirts and sold some. We developed a couple of Hayes tees that we sold in the pop shop with Keith Haring, um, but I hadn't sort of put it on my back as a full time brand. Um, and when we did, after I don't know six, seven, eight years, uh, sort of pushing the rock up the hill, doing the trade shows, full lines, and developing accounts around the world, I sort of had a realization that um, perhaps the world didn't need me to make another pair of cargo pants. Um, <laughs> that, you know that 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 we were that we were sort of falling into this uh, easy trap of. Uh, be just becoming a clothing company. Right. And I had come from an art background and a design background and, and had sort of always seen the clothing company as a platform to sort of explore any other products, sneakers being one of them. Um, so after sort of the first decade of being able to do a skateboard and able to do jewelry and able to do a motorcycle with Honda and a sneaker with Nike, um, I sort of started to realize um, that, A, there was kind of more power and a greater reach in working with people in their industries instead of trying to sort of uh, figure out how to do it myself. If mm -hmm. I wanted to do a, you know, if I wanted to do a snowboard, I didn't want to get in the snowboard business. I wanted to work with Burton um, right, and yeah. work with the, the, you know, work with the leaders um, to put my fingerprints on their amazing product. And that's really, uh, uh, I had sort of said that to myself in around 99, 2000, that I wanted to shift um, my role and the face of our brand and company back to being, instead of being a clothing company that put out art and design, I wanted to be an art and design based company that put out product. It's some of its semantics, but um, I wanted to level back my own playing field so that um, I could be a little more focused and uh, play my position better instead of having to play all positions and, and be the franchise owner, coach, and player. Mm -hmm. um, working with the Nikes allowed me to just sort of step onto their court and shoot the ball more comfortably. So um, it's, it's a little of the chicken and the egg for me, the collaboration era, because I had sort of made a conscious internal decision that I wanted to that I wanted my company to be more collaborative, that I didn't right. want to exist on this island, that I realized there was a sort of, when you own your own brand, certainly if it's your own name, um, you know, you've got to be aware of not sort of ending up on an island with your own, your own brand and your own team. And, Isn't Tokyo an island? Uh, yeah. Conceptually, <laughs> conceptually. <laughs> Is it crazy to see we see this dunk reemergence and the resale market exploding continuously? Is it crazy to see the value that those shoes still hold, thousands and thousands of dollars? Those two dunks. Do you ever check? Uh, do you ever check what they're going for? You know, funny you should ask because I was with a, a friend and, and a partner of mine in. in the art world and mm -hmm. his son was wilding out online showing me all his favorite sneakers so i was kind of having a sneaker moment with a 10 year old and, yeah. um you know just kind of seeing what he was vibing on and then when he was done i was like let, let me show you something and, and <laughs> you know googled googled hayes air 
Googled Hayes Dunks, and uh, there was an eight thousand dollar pair. Um, wow. So yeah, that's that's a little mind boggling. Um, and the truth is, uh, you know, there's two levels to it. There's the commercial release, which there was, I believe, five thousand pieces in the orange boxes, mm-hmm. um, and then I believe a total of five hundred friends and family with the Hayes tag on the tongue on the label. And of those 500, um, 250 went through Nike's hands and 250 went through my hands. Mm. And, and for, for one little extra gem of information, there were not, if I remember correctly, and you know it's almost 20 years ago, there mm. were not size labels in the white boxes on the friends and family. So we produced our own size labels Mm. that we applied to the ones that came out our door to friends and family. So if you see a black and white um, laser print uh, size label slapped inside the blank white box, that will typically tell you it came out my door directly. It's wow. a good marker of authenticity. Do, do you remember how you released those back in 2003? Like, what did you do on the day of release? Was there chaos? Um, you know, it's funny because I'm, uh, unlike uh, Stash at the time, I wasn't, in, I wasn't in the retail business. I didn't have, mm-hmm. I didn't necessarily have, I didn't have flagship, flagships in America. So uh, most of mine were seeding. There was no sort of retail through our end of friends and family, um, but I do, I do, uh, I do remember some pe- some people who I were close with catching feelings because their shop didn't get it on the first round, and you know, I'm, I'm I, I I got to raise my hand and say I'm not the distributor. <laughs> Hayes, you you get to like parlay the sneaker success. After that, you end up doing a New Balance 574 in 2005. Did you kind of feel like you were like, how did that collaboration happen? But did you kind of feel like you were like a hot sneaker designer at that point? Like you kind of had a career in footwear going forward off of that shoe? Um, Yes. And uh, in part because by then we had our own retail operations. We had three different stores in Tokyo. So... um, you know, in in, uh, in sort of fair market speak, we were a lot more interesting to the brands when we had a retail outlet. Um, and the New Balance release was actually Japan only, and that was uh, specific to New Balance Japan linking with my, at that time I had staff and a whole team on the ground in Japan. So that was, that was set up through their channels with my fingerprints. Yeah. And New Balance, obviously huge in Japan. Anyways, like how did that release in Japan compare to the Nike Dunk release in, in your opinion? Um, I don't think they. I don't think they're even a fair comparison, to be honest. Um, you know, I think uh, there's, there's, as we say in boxing, there's levels to it. Um, <laughs> and, and you know, let me say this: for me personally, as a designer, um, I, I try and fall in love with everything I do. Mm-hmm. I don't pick favorites. I don't, you know, the the the. How it ultimately resonates with the audience in the light of history, um, uh, to some degree, depends on a lot of external factors, not just my creative output. So, um, you know, I've done I've done Converse, I've done New Balance, I've done a number of Nikes, um, and the the to me one of the keys of longevity is to look at everything you are about to do like it might be the most important thing you ever do and it may be a throw it may turn out to be a throwaway and it uh but um you know i've i've sort of been recently reminded in the fine art world um that you may have favorite pieces of work that you've done but um don't play favorites and uh never never um 
Never judge for yourself what the world is going to decide is your best work. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, uh, I think obviously the dunk because of it, I'd love to say it's because the sneaker is so great. And, right. Um, but it's not just the sneaker. It's the time, place, mm -hmm. uh, confluence. And um, I'll share something else with you. Um about the dunk in particular, which was that if you look back 20 years in sort of sneaker culture, what was going on then was NikeTalk.com. Yes. That was, that was sort of, that, that was where the heat was. And, yep. and at the same time, that was where Nike's attention was directed. That was how, you know, now we're in all these metrics and stuff 20 years later, but back then it was sort of, you could see, you could tell whether something was getting heat or not, mm -hmm. whether it was blowing up on NikeTalk.com. Yes. Period. So when the sneaker came out, um, I sort of had this gut feeling um, that Nike was going to be focused on sp specifically just on the sneaker market. They mm -hmm. wanted to know how how the was red, how, their, how the sneaker yeah. was registering with sneakerheads, which. Of course, that was important, but as a streetwear brand, uh, uh, call it even a lifestyle brand, I was most interested in how it would cross over. I, you know, I wasn't in the sneaker business per se, but um, I, the, the, the uh, cultural capital was important to me. Um, how it translated and uh, in, a, in, a, in a full circle of life here, one of the things I did was reach out to people like Noah Callahan Bever at Complex and mm -hmm. reach out to, you know, my man Sasha at Mass Appeal. And I made an extra effort at the time to cross the project over into hip hop lifestyle um, press where it was available and i think that that to me that's part of the light that the dunk lives in mm -hmm. is that um uh, between nike's push in their market and my sort of reach in the indie uh behind closed doors friends and family world um i was able to push it out um, in some directions that uh, maybe these collaborations hadn't necessarily been pushed before. And uh, th to me, that's that's the greatest accomplishment of that sneaker was its crossover to some degree. Did you ever go on Nike Talk and see what people were saying about it on there? Um, I probably did, although <laughs> I was I wasn't really a, I wasn't really a Nike Talk or Saster guy at the time. Okay, <laughs> or maybe maybe make some fake accounts so the Nike people know that there's a lot of heat on it, right? Well, you know, if you think about it, um, this was this was when we were st still trying to figure out what the word blog meant, right? Yeah, um, yeah. And then and then I think. The first one was, uh, I'm going to date myself, evilmanito.com, oh, okay. um, which, which, remember that? That was Rick, real. Ricky, that was influential. Was that, was that Ricky Kim? Rick, yeah, Ricky, Ricky Kim and mm -hmm. Sky yes. Gilotli, who now yes. manages Lenny. So, um, yes. you know, things, uh, things grew out of that. Uh, and then 12 Ounce Profit was, yes. was where we all really got our blogs and our soap boxes to get on and um you know i want to talk more though about kind of your relationship with nike over the years because you've you've done shoes with a, a couple different brands you did the huff project rest in peace you, you had some, some kids at, at a time but your nike work was so consistent and i want to take it to that air force one that we see sitting behind you right now in 2015 how did that come about and, and how did you get back to doing a sneaker with nike um you know we uh i, I think Fair to say, we just waited our turn for another at bat. Mm -hmm. um, you know, look, uh, uh, we're we're a dyed in the wool indie, right? We've been here, same same playing field, same team, same mindset, thirty plus years, um, and if you understand the mechanics of doesn't matter if it's Nike or G-Shock or any of the sort of larger international brands we work with. Um, 
you know, there's a certain amount of turnover. There's a certain amount of growth right. internally. Um, so the the and it's it's uh, it's not a negative uh, comment on Nike or anybody. It's just corporate culture. Uh, people people tend to move up or move on. Um, so uh, I would say. Uh, each of our projects represents sort of a different capsule of people mm-hmm. at Nike who are the motivated. Teams turnover. Within, yeah. Yeah. Within people, within, within periods of time, within uh, periods of teams and relationships, things uh, can take hold and get to market in, in sort of a cycle. Um, what was interesting, uh, without going into sort of great detail, was that w- when we were well, we were given the opportunity to do the Air Force One, which frankly was the one I was always waiting for because mm-hmm. I'm an Air Force One guy. Um, uh, you know that it was it was a it was a huge opportunity, obviously. Um, under any circumstance, whether it was my first sneaker or my 21st sneaker, you know, being able to put your fingerprints on an Air Force One is is everybody in this market's dream. So we, we embraced it for all it was worth. Um, but the irony to my earlier point about shifting sort of tides was that when we got the project, I actually went out of my way to make it a collaborative project with the um, then uh, bespoke team at what right. was then yeah. 21 Mercy. Mm-hmm. So my man Izzy Mateo, yeah. he, was, yeah. he was manning that. So my guy Jay and I went in with our ideas and our concepts, but um, with Izzy and... Uh, and, now, maybe. Um, and Dave, Dave Verricker, was, right? Dave Verricker. Um, we kind of pulled in Dave and Izzy and said, look, um, we know how to do what we do well, but like you guys know materials better than we do. You guys like, you know, let's let's put our heads together. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not a control freak that way. I just want I want the best result. And if it takes, it doesn't matter if it's two people or six people. We, we, we wanted, we wanted everybody in the New York Nike team who'd been so generous and supportive of us to feel included in this big sort of moment of ours. So, um, we had developed different materials and the Tyvek and uh, we were going to do a running stitch on the back heel. Mm-hmm. Like the, they were supposed to be called the black books. Okay. Oh, okay. Because wow. They, they were they were the original concept, and this is maybe the first time we've gotten a chance to air this. Was we wanted them to be a direct reflection of the black books. That's where the pebble grain came from the 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 binding of the black books and the Tyvek and the and all the handwritten stuff, whether it was the air on the on the sole or the or the tongue. Um, and we were wanted to seal the deal with a little skippy running stitch like that center page on on the back heel. Right. Um, but the truth is, um, the team shifted during that process, and Izzy ended up in port. Both Izzy and Dave ended up with Portland. Right. And the project was creatively and physically completed. But there was such internal shift, we were now waiting for a new team to come in and sort of re-embrace the project and find the, uh, the timing and placement of it. Um, so that probably sat in the shoot for nine extra months while, um, while water found its own level again internally. And then uh, at that point, to be honest, we, we were just psyched to have them out. Just they put didn't it out. end up officially getting wrapped in the same concept we had sort of hoped. But, uh, hey, it's a, it's, it's a win any way you slice it. So we were just uh, – we, we were thrilled they came out. And uh, to be honest, I can't remember which came first, the sportswear collection or the sneaker. 
I think, I the, think sports the sportswear collection, collection came first. Sports. Yeah, 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 yeah. I and remember I, I had one of those shirts. Mm-hmm. You know, to 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 that to that earlier point, you know, we had sort of hoped and pushed that the Air Force One would go out with the Air Force One uh, garment collection. Right. But yeah. um, again, to the greater point, if you understand how how corporate really works, um, you know, uh, working with the sportswear department does not dictate a sneaker or vice versa by, you know, simply because you're under the umbrella. And Hayes, you've done so many different products and your art is is so well known. Where does the sneaker legacy that you have kind of rank in the pantheon of all your collaborations and the products you've done when you look back at it? Very high. Uh, you know, the dunk, the, the dunk in terms of impact and reach, um, you know, there, look, uh, in terms of what I was saying before about um, what you call external forces, um, I'd say the dunk you know the the beastie boys check your head album cover had as much reach and impact as anything i did um in the uh music arena let's say Mm -hmm. entertainment um and i would have to say that the nike dunk in its time um reached more people reached a new audience and uh, sort of broke but blew a lot of doors open for me at the time as a brand and as a product designer. So um, I, I really would put the, the dunk sort of top five in, in the legacy of all the products I've done. And you end up working on that Beastie Boys Americana Low Adidas sneaker, right? Um, and, mm-hmm. that, and that shoe was limited to, I believe, like 120 pairs, only sold in Brooklyn. Um, can you walk us through that project and how big that was for you to work on, given your connection to the group? Um, I would say that, you know, I didn't have a lot hands on in the development of that. Um, that was sort of a. Uh, just a nice opportunity to put my fingerprints on it with the original lettering and some of that, um, you know, back to external forces. Um, it, that sneaker was really well received. Um, Mm -hmm. and it really popped. Uh, but I didn't create anything new for that myself. Um, so, uh, the, the, the cultural capital of that has more to do, again, with the timing and placement. And, and, you know, there was a moment where, say, Adams, the remaining beasties, and I were all together in that environment in front of the sneakers, in front of the hand lettering, in front of all these things. And um, sometimes, uh, let's say it's hard for me to parse uh What's a big moment for me personally versus a big moment for me uh, professionally? Like, like I don't feel like I did more than lend something that already existed to that, but the fact that we're all still here, standing there 35 years later looking at it, that's kind of the moment to me. Yeah. Was it, was it weird to be kind of aligned with an Adidas product for the first time? I just, don't, I just want to know, like, how close you feel connected to Nike because Nike is such a big part of your, your output on like a pop cultural level. Was it weird for you to be in this different lane? You know what I mean? No, not at all. Um, look, I, I, uh, bottom line, I, wel- the thing I welcome most is, uh, new roads, new terrain. If I, yeah. if I can, uh, if I can, uh, get some scratches on my elbow from, 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 uh, being the first one on a path, um, I'm there. Uh, so, uh, I think a, a real fair way to put it and look at it is this, we, we are totally considerate and respectful of all these relationships, certainly in the times at which they exist. You know, if, if you're never going to see an Adidas or a Converse coming out in the same breath as a Nike, um, but I sort of feel like it's a two-way street. Um, 
Nike isn't going to say we worked with Hayes, so now we can't work with other artists. Right. Um, so I feel like that's a two way street. They wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't, they, there's just common sense to it. Um, you know, I don't think Nike would bring too many people, too many different dates to the same dance and neither would we. Um, but, it's nice to have different dance partners when you get a chance. <laughs> I got to say, hearing that story about the Air Force One and how it came about, I, I may be prompted after this to go back and buy a pair. I have a funny anecdote. Hayes, I met you, I think, at the Brooklyn Museum that same year these came out because they had that sneaker exhibition there and the shoe had just come out. And I remember distinctly my, my hearing was kind of bad at the time. I had an ear issue and I'm like, Hayes is here. I have to go tell him how much I appreciate that Air Force One. So I was trying to have this conversation <laughs> with you about the shoe and you I'm like hear halfway trying to understand what you're saying and I'm like nodding. I'm like, I hope I'm coherent right now, but I, I just love how you know subtle it was and the, the arrow on the midsole, but just, just a funny moment for me in that sneaker. <laughs> right on. Well, you know, le less is more, right? Absolutely. I, th I think you told me the same thing at th back then. Hey, so... At the end of Style Wars, it's kind of uh, there's the whole debate on graffiti's dead. Everyone wants to make money off of it. Writers don't want to get into selling their their art for money. I saw an interview I think with Stussy where you said you never wanted to sell your artwork for like one piece of art for a billion dollars. You'd want to get it out to the people and have as many people have it as possible do you feel like you've been able to accomplish that mission through doing the sneakers yes and the world has sort of come along with me i mean i think that's uh the 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 easiest illustration i can i can draw of that is that 30 years ago when 40 years ago even when we were sort of trying to develop our sense of politics and our sense of purpose as artists um, coming from graffiti, um, it was clear to me we were, we were coming from a populist culture and a populist set of politics. Um, you know, graffiti wasn't elitist. It was, it was about getting a message out um, for free to the maximum amount of people on a daily basis. And then there was a conversation, you know, amongst, amongst us. Um, <clears throat> so some of my younger, maybe more idealistic stances in terms of what's commercial and what's not. Um, yes, at the time I sort of came up with a equation that, <clears throat> well, if it's a choice between selling one piece of work to a wealthy individual for a million dollars as a as a luxury purchase versus maybe making a million stickers selling them and getting them out there for a buck a pop to a million people the math to me was reaching a million people instead of reaching just one person that said um one of the things that was a real paradigm shift to me when I came back to New York 15 years ago after mm -hmm. a decade plus in Los Angeles, what I was most struck by was how those walls that I perceived between these mediums and disciplines had really melted away. And that it, to some degree, the most interesting and fertile ground was this gray area between art and between product, between commerce and between, you know, what people considered sort of personal. And, you know, I consider Brian Cause sort of the shiny example. Um, and, you know, even as a younger man and artist, I understood the legacy from Andy Warhol to Keith Haring to sort of, let's say, my generation, if not me specifically, that um, it was our mission and role to challenge these notions of high and low. That, 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 you know, I always wanted to believe if you did good work and you got it out there, um, that was really it. It wasn't about all the smoke and mirrors and the marketing and the machinery of it. Um, but the truth is, over time, um, 
not only did the world soften its edges in terms of these definitions, Mm -hmm. but um, I personally sort of softened my approach to it that um, uh, maybe I had been sort of putting things in too much of a box in my own head that um, I started realizing that uh, perhaps there was room for everything in, in... one man's life or under one umbrella that because I had chose to embrace commercialism doesn't mean, didn't mean I couldn't carve out another path personally for what I do as an artist and uh, sort of vice versa. So um, I'm not sure if I sort of (laughs) answered the original question, um, but the, the, the products the products have sort of uh, had a life of their own. Did you ever feel like that commercialism was at odds with some of the tenets of graffiti? I mean, I mean, I know you stopped writing graffiti in 1983, but there's this interesting interview with Kunle Martin's uh, Ear Snot from the Iraq crew, and I think Sacer at the time. This was maybe around 2005, before there was an Iraq Adidas sneaker, and they're kind of joking around, and Kunle says, doing graffiti is, is, is not about getting a sneaker collabo. And it was kind of at this time where there were a lot of graffiti writers who were getting Nike collabs in the early 2000s. And I think it seemed like, I'm kind of paraphrasing for him at the time, but that graffiti was about vandalism or or, or destruction or or something so anti that that creating a shoe with a corporation was almost the opposite of that. Did you ever have that kind of push and pull or had you walked away from graffiti so long before that it wasn't really an issue to you? Um... I'm glad you asked that question because it was sort of the the final thread I lost there in the last one, which is that, um, yes, but I believed that it was possible to split the atom Mm -hmm. when I was that young. Um, What I did personally, and I I can speak for anybody else in terms of their take on the politics of graffiti and art, is that at around 21 years old, uh, we had already sort of, we'd had a taste of uh, what it was like to get paid for our work and hang our work on gallery walls and sort of, uh, we'd had that light bulb moment that, wow, this could actually be a career. This, this little sport we were playing, kicking the ball around in the dark, could actually lead to something. And, and um, we got this profound sense of self-empowerment. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, I totally rejected the notion then that graffiti should be on a gallery wall. I was right. very much a purist. Um, so in my head, I decided to do two things at the same time. I decided to go even harder as a graffiti artist because I sort of felt like this is a sport I'm going to play when I'm young and I know the time's going to come to hang up my cleats and I want to like put up the best stats I can while I'm playing. Uh, But I also went back to school and I went to school visual arts for three years while I was, we were, we were bombing nights and going and developing my portfolio during the daytime because on the other side of my brain, I was very clear that um, uh, I wasn't confusing my art per se, or my graffiti per se, with what I was going to enter the workplace with, um, I wanted to translate that um, passion and skill set of the written word from graffiti. Mm -hmm. I I wanted to turn that into the skill set of logo design and typography and learn how to apply. I'd spent a childhood... um, Uh, developing my own name and my own identity and and I wanted to learn how to uh, excel and make a living helping other people define and design their identity so I became to some degree an identity designer having come from a culture of identity Um, and to your original point in question when I hung up my cleats in 1983 and I right. stopped, you know, we, I hung up my cleats at the top <laughs> of my game. You know, we sort of took the pennant in 82 and 83 <laughs> and RTW. Yeah. And then I walked away and said, this is my career now. This isn't this playtime's over. 
and uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I want to uh, make a life and a career and create value. Um, that said, if, if you know my history as a graffiti artist and you study my career as a designer, I left SE3 behind. Right. I left, you know, I have two names and identities as a graffiti artist. SE3 was my primary name and what I bombed. Hayes was sort of a backup name for more letters and more style. And uh, to me, that was the, the defining moment was saying to myself, the trains know me as SE3. So I'm not going to pimp SE3 as an artist or a brand. SE3 was the graffiti writer. Hayes is now the brand. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I actually, I heard another graffiti artist recently um, calling himself a purist because he never did commercial work. Um, he continues to do freight trains and walls. Um, and... I kind of took exception to that in my head because um, I consider myself a purist too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I left my graffiti pure in its element, in its essence. Crystallized and I in went, that form. Uh, and I left it. I didn't go on doing freights. I didn't go on doing walls. I have never done an SE3 piece um, in the modern landscape because... Not that it wouldn't be fun to do or people would dig it, but I wanted to stay uh, firm and true to that belief and that choice. And to me, coming back and scribbling my name every now and then because it was fun was sort of that was the compromise. That's where I was no longer a purist if I was going to just, uh, you know, put that chocolate in my peanut butter. Hayes, we can't thank you enough chopping it up with us and discussing all your projects and your sneaker legacy especially we're all big fans of you and um again just thanks so much for giving us this time well thank thank you for making time for me and uh i hope you guys will have me back in the fall because i'm not going to give the game away but we got footwear coming out yes. in the fall luxury okay. lu lug think luxury and i'll see you again in the season I'm nice we'll do it. it in studio <laughs> all right bet I'll see you. I'll see you. I'll see you in studio next time, fellas. I appreciate you. Thank Take you. care. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, man. All right. Peace, everybody out there. Thank you, everybody, for watching another episode of the Complex Sneakers Podcast. We will be back next week. It may it may look like this. It may look like a little something else. Some of us may be here. Some of us may not. But we'll all be here in some form. In spirit. <laughs> <laughs>